Yes, a king. And so in Oracle 4, he comes up with a king, and check this out, chapter 4, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Okay, as Balaam's saying, he's a prophet. I see him, but not now. It's not going to happen for a while. I see him, but not, I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, and a scepter will rise out of Israel. A scepter is a symbol of what, what, what being usually carries a scepter? A king. A scepter is a metonymy, is a metonymy for a king. It's a figure of speech for a king. A scepter stands for a king. And he says, a, a scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the he foreheads of Moab. But notice here the parallelism between a star will come out of Jacob and a scepter will come out of Israel. A scepter and a star are being paralleled. A scepter and a star. I ask you, in what other place in the Bible, and I think it is the only one outside the book of Revelation, where a star and a scepter or a king are associated? A star and a king. Can you tell me of another place in the Bible where a star and a king are associated? Yeah. Jesus' birth, okay? Jesus' birth. You had what happened at Jesus' birth. The wise men came, the Magi came. By the way, where were the Magi from? Where were the wise men from? You say, well, they were from the east. Where is the east? Mesopotamia. Were the wise men from Mesopotamia? Where was Balaam from? Mesopotamia. How did the wise men know to follow that star to go to Jerusalem to ask, where is he that's been born king of the Jews? Is it possible, now this is total conjecture on my part, total conjecture, is it possible that Balaam, who was from Mesopotamia, that his prophecy, his four oracles, went back to Mesopotamia with them, and that the wise men were reading the oracle of Balaam? By the way, was Balaam known at 800 BC? That's like 600 years later. Was this guy still a famous prophet? And that those prophecies were known, and so they see a star, and they say, hey, a star, a scepter will rise out of Jacob, and they go to Jerusalem to seek the king of the Jews. And so what I'm wondering is if this passage was used by the Magi or the wise men to find out about the star leading them to a scepter in Israel and that this refers to Jesus. By the way, would this tie together the divine king and the human king? Would that put those two together? Now, okay, is this conjecture? Yes, it is conjecture, okay? So do I hold it like this with an open hand? Okay, I hold it with an open hand. It's conjecture on my part, but it seems to make sense to me. And so I look at this and I say, this is a really cool messianic prophecy of Jesus. A star and a scepter come to Israel. The wise men come in there. And so I just wonder if it came from Balaam. Now, Balaam, what do we know about Balaam here? Yes, Juan. On the first, Balaam's first or four oracle slides, he said that the second oracle is God's character and promises don't change. Yes, that's and correct. Yeah. So you said yeah, actually, the, the oracles, I said two things about them. Actually, we did in the first slide, we did the first two oracles, and I was trying to deal with the issue of change. And then we went back to the second and third and fourth oracle, but went back to the second oracle, this time looking at what it says about the king. And, and by the way, the oracles are long. They're about 10 verses each or so, and I didn't read through the whole oracle, so they address those two topics are addressed in the second third oracles, but good point. Uh, why is Balaam portrayed so positively in the narrative? Balaam seems to give forth even a messianic prophecy. He seems to give forward uh, these great oracles and things like that. I think what's going on is that there's a contrast in the text. There's a contrast between Israel's unfaithfulness and Balaam's faithfulness. Balaam, a pagan poet, a prophet, Balaam, a pagan prophet, is more faithful to God than Israel is. Balaam is more faithful than Israel is. And so there's a contrast between Balaam, a pagan prophet, and Israel. And the pagan prophet is more faithful to God at this point. And so I think this contrast is... And by the way, um, can you look at different people in different ways? Is, is a person all bad? or is a, Have you met somebody that's really, really bad? Um, I know, personally I know, the guy who holds in the state of Indiana the most life sentences against him. He has the record in the state of Indiana. He has like 11 life sentences against him. Um, I, I, uh, anyways, I'll just call him, I'll call him by his real name, his first name, Dave. He's a friend of mine, okay? Now, is Dave a totally bad dude? 
Now, by the way, did Dave do some really, really, really bad stuff? Yes, he did, okay. Is Dave totally bad? No, no, okay. I, I just, what I'm telling you is I know murderers, multiple murderers, that many of these guys, to be honest with you, they're my friends, okay. And I want to tell you, yeah, they did some things that were really, really bad, but I want to tell you that there's good. Can, can you look at a person, question, and can you see, take a person that's really bad, can you see some good in the person? On the other hand, can you see a person that's really good? Say your roommate. Is your roommate good or bad? Now, by the way, if you get in your head, your roommate's a bad person all the time, can you look at your roommate and see, you know, is the cup half full or half empty? And you see all the bad stuff with them. What about your parents, your brothers and sisters? Do you know all the bad stuff of your brothers and sisters and stuff? What I'm saying is a person, you can choose how you look at a person, okay? And what I'm saying is the Balaam story is told with a positive light on Balaam initially. But then the story changes. And so what I'm saying is people are not good or bad. By the way, when you get married, is your wife good or bad? Or is your husband good or bad? What you're going to find out is that your husband and your wife both have some very positive things and some very negative things. If you focus only on the negative things, can you say, you know, or positive things in my case and stuff, and I just say, my wife is the most wonderful person in the world. And, you know, what are the bad sides? She doesn't have any bad sides and stuff. I say that on tape. This is recorded on tape, so... Okay, and I also tell you I'm lying, okay? <laughs> I've been married to her for 36 years, and so I know she's got problems and stuff. But by the way, do I also have my problems? And if she chooses to look at my problems, I mean, she can choose to look at my problem, and that's all she can see is my problems, my problems, and problems. And you keep looking at the problems all the time, pretty soon what happens to your marriage? It goes down the tube. So every once in a week and stuff, she kind of looks at something that's positive about me. So <laughs> that was a joke, thank you, okay? Um, actually, she's probably the best thing that ever happened to me in my life outside Jesus Christ. And I mean, no, I didn't mean to say, oh, you didn't have to know my wife. She's just a wonderful person. But um, but anyways, uh, now, so what I'm saying is, but what I'm trying to say is, do you see the perspective you take? Think about your roommate, okay? Can you look negatively? Can you look positively? And, and you can destroy the relationship if you only see one side of things. So here's what Balaam did. Now, this is on the sly. In Numbers chapter 25, it says, Israel was staying in Shittim, and the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women. The men began to in indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women, who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. So not only is it immorality, but it's immorality in the context of worship. And that was what they did in the ancient days, that part of the worship service of Baal worship, Hamash, in this case probably from Moab, and stuff was immorality, that you committed immorality. And so the people ate and bowed down before these gods. So Israel joined in worshiping Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. And now all of a sudden, Israel is going to be cursed. Why is Israel cursed? Because they sinned. So here's how it went down, most likely. How did Israel get cursed? Balaam refused to curse Israel himself. He refused because God told him, you better say exactly what I tell you. Balaam did that. However, ba did Balaam know that the only way to get Israel cursed was to do what? Get them to sin. So it's believed that Balaam, it's not believed, it's stated explicitly, I'll show you in a minute, that Balaam told the Moabites to put their women out there to seduce their men into this worship of these other gods so that Israel would sin and God would judge them. Balaam set that up. Is that really evil? Yes. And so Balaam set that up. And so in 25, it talks about this. But then if you go down just a bit, you see Balaam's death in chapter 31. This is six chapters later, okay? Six chapters later, you got in, in Numbers 36, it says... They killed all these people. They also killed Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. So Israel catches Balaam, and they kill him. And then down in verse 16, it says this. They were the ones who followed Balaam's advice. They followed Balaam's advice and were the means for turning the Israelites away from the Lord in what happened at Peor, so that a plague struck the Lord's people. So Balaam gave the advice for these Moabite women to go out and seduce and stuff. Balaam was the guy behind that. So Balaam is a Judas kind of figure. He's going to go after money or the word of God. He proclaims the word of God, but then he goes after this money thing and, and, and offers his advice to get Israel cursed. And God does curse them because they sinned. And so Balaam, why is Balaam portrayed so positively? Because of the contrast with Israel's faithfulness and, and his faithfulness. So that's the book of Numbers.